you've chosen the right bike, you've had a few rides now, you're getting used to it, and it's time to start dialing in your setup and figure out what goes into really dialing in your bike. And this is something that is pretty hard to figure out right away. It almost takes a couple bike rides to really figure out what you like the feel of on your bike and what you don't. So much of what I'm about to give you here in terms of information is personal preference based. Let's take a look at my bike and some of the things I do to really dial in my setup. First up is the cockpit. So I'm talking about the handlebars, the stem, the brake levers, the dropper post lever. All of this here is the front end of the bike and it's where all your controls are. And that's why I'm so picky about how they feel. I like them to feel perfect all the time. And whenever I have to go on a trip and I have to rebuild my bike up, it's always really annoying for me to get the angles perfect. So the first thing you need to think about is the angle that your handlebar is at. This is 100% personal preference and it depends on what you like the feel of. Some people like their bars way rolled forward, other people like them slammed back more. The more you have your bar rolled back, the more back sweep it's gonna have. So you're gonna feel like you're almost sitting back on the handlebars a little more. You're not gonna be right over the front end. For me, I like them pretty aggressive and pretty high up and swept forward. As you can see here, the angle of the bar itself is pretty much perfectly <laughs> parallel with the ground. It's not like sweeping back at all or forward. The reason I like it so straight up and down is because that goes back to my dirt jump BMX roots with the really aggressive high up handlebar. Next up is the brake levers. I like these to have the same feel as my handlebars and what I mean is I like to have them more of a straight up and down feeling rather than swept back. And that means I don't like having my wrist rolled back and I don't like feeling like I'm swept back on my bike with my brakes way up here. I like having them down as vertical as possible and really slammed far down. This is a very aggressive way to run your brakes because you have to have your, almost your elbows up and out all the time more. And since I'm always in an aggressive riding position, this is really comfortable for me. I'm not straining my wrists. And it's really great because when I'm dirt jumping or even when I'm just like riding all the time, I feel like having one finger on the brake all the time is it a lot more comfortable when I have the levers slammed down like this. Next up is all the other little levers and pieces on my bike. So I'm talking about the dropper post, the shifter. I'm sure you'll notice here that I have it distanced quite far away from the grip. It's at least an inch and a half away from the grips. A lot of bike stock that you see in a bike shop, everything's slammed in close and tight together because that's just how things come in the box and a lot of riders like it that way. For me, I'm a little unique because I'm always dirt jumping, I'm doing tricks. I'm doing a lot of things that involve my wrist rolling around on the handlebar, so I like having more room. Even my dropper lever, you can see I keep it on the opposite end of my brake lever from my grip, so it's as far away from my grip as possible. This keeps it out of my way, so when I bring my hand in closer to the stem, it's still, my thumb is still like not even coming close to hitting the lever, and that's nice for me because when I'm doing all those movements, I have all this free space to move around with. Same thing with the shifter on the right side. In terms of handlebar length, it's an ongoing trend in the sport for bars to get wider and wider. I remember back in the day when a 28 inch wide bar, so the equivalent of like 740 millimeters was considered wide. Now everything comes stock at 800 mils. So it's pretty wide, bars are big. The wider the bars, the more stable the ride. The narrower the bars, the more nimble and flickable your front end be kind of becomes. For me, I have narrower shoulders and that's also a factor to put into consideration. If you're a smaller rider, you might want narrower bars. The handlebars on this bike in specific are at 760 millimeters and that's pretty much what I run across the board for all my bikes, except for my dirt jump bike where I go extra narrow to have the flickability for tricks that involve spinning the handlebars around. The next thing you wanna look at is your suspension. Whether or not you're on a hardtail, you'll probably have a suspension fork on the front of your bike. The number one thing you can do to really change the feel of it is how stiff it is. Most forks are air these days and it's fairly simple. You can just undo the top of them. You can put in a shock pump and you can adjust it accordingly. When you get a brand new bike, the back of the fork will have a user manual or a little guide that will show you how much air to put in based on your weight. So it really varies. For me, I usually go 20 or 30 PSI above the recommended because I like having a stiffer fork that really is going to handle the bigger jumps and the more aggressive, steeper ramps better than an average mountain bike setup. Most riders out there really like to have something that's nice and subtle for small, small bumps. So they'll set it up around the recommended weight. And then in addition to that, they'll play with their low and high speed compression. So think about your low and high speed compression as a more progressive style of adjusting your rebound. 
If I dial down the low speed compression, my fork's gonna become bouncier. And if I crank it up, it will become a little more like sluggish and softer. And then I can also adjust the rebound itself, which is essentially just adjusting the speed that the fork's moving up and down. It's a really linear, basic adjustment. Compression really gets into like how your fork reacts at different speeds. There's so much that goes into this. It's very technical and depending on what brand and level of fork you ride, there is so much you can do. So we're not gonna get too detailed with this, but those are the basics you need to know. Next up, it's time to look at the rear shock. With the rear shock, there's so much that goes into it. It's very technical. Some have lockout switches, some don't. Some have all this low and high speed compression adjustments, some don't. There's so much I could get into, but I'm not gonna get super technical. I'm just gonna give you a general overlay here. So number one, make sure you have the right amount of air in it for your riding style and for your weight. If you go way below air levels, for example, say you weigh 200 pounds and you only put 100 PSI in, that means you could potentially blow the shock and break it because it'll blow through the travel way too easily. And then if you put too much air in it, it's not gonna move the way you want it to. You really have to figure out what the recommended settings are and then adjust within like a 20 to 30 PSI range depending on your riding style and what you're really looking for. Many rear shocks come with a climb switch, meaning there's a little switch on the canister here and when you flick it to one side, it will lock out the suspension so it can't even move. Some shocks even give you the option of three different settings. So you can be like fully locked out, half locked out or completely wide open. The shock on my bike doesn't give me any of those options and it's because I have a really unique frame design where pedaling is optimized, so I don't have to really worry about losing my energy when I'm climbing up the hill. My rear end's not gonna bounce around very often in those scenarios. But if you just kinda got on a full suspension bike for the first time and you start going up the hill and you notice the rear suspension is killing your energy, that's when you need to make sure you have a climb switch, and if you don't, maybe you need a little more air in the rear. And those are the basics you need to know about rear shocks. There's so much more that goes into it. It can get very technical, but we'll leave it at that for now. Let's take a look at my tire pressure and a few other settings. There's a general rule of thumb when it comes to tire pressure. A higher PSI will give you a faster rolling riding experience, but a lower PSI will give you more traction. And if the conditions are muddy like they are right now for me, and I'm running my mud tires with my huge side knobs, then I'm gonna wanna run a lower PSI to keep traction as high as possible. Rolling as quick as I can isn't my number one priority. But if it's the summertime and I'm running grippy, hard packed, nice surfaces and I wanna go faster, I'm gonna run my PSI nice and high. I'm talking like 25 PSI to 30, which is considered high for me because I only weigh 140 pounds. Running 15 to 20 PSI would be considered very low, yet it can be favorable in some situations because you get a lot of grip. The number one downfall of this though is you have the chance of getting pinch flats really easily or burping your tire. And that's why we see things like tire inserts on a tubeless setup becoming very universal. This gives you the opportunity to run your tires nice and low, giving you ultimate traction with the chance of getting a flat tire very low. Right now the way I have my bike set up is I have a lower PSI on mud tires. I'm running tires with big side knobs that can handle the mud really well and then I'm running around 20 PSI. Being only 140 pounds, this is still low for me. It's pretty common to run in the 25 to 30 range, but depending on your weight, you might go even higher or lower. This is something you kind of figure out with experience and personal preference. The next important step to dialing in your setup is figuring out what kind of pedals you want to run. Do you want to be on flat pedals or clipless? Now on my bikes, I run flats pretty much exclusively. I've never even owned a clipless pedal. I tried a few races on clipless bikes before, on someone else's setup and I did not like it. I did not like the feel of being stuck to my bike and being clipped in. However, a lot of riders love this because it gives them the opportunity to get up climbs easier. They love that connection with the bike. With racers, it's very common to run a clipless setup where your feet literally clip into the pedals and you're stuck in there. Although I do love the freedom of taking my feet off the pedals and moving them around as much as possible and just not feeling like I'm ever stuck to my bike, I do know it's important to have really nice grip and be stuck to your pedals really well when you need to. And that's why I choose a nice flat pedal like this one. It's got a large platform, yet tall pins. So I have lots of space to move my feet around on, but I can grip in and lock into it really well if I need to. The final thing you need to know about is your saddle height. This is something the bike shop will help you with when you first get your bike. They will set it up so when your dropper post or your regular seat post is up at its highest setting, that your knees are in a nice spot for pedal strokes for climbing. But when you're not going uphill and you're going down, knowing where you want your saddle to sit on your bike in terms of the height is really personal preference. 
For me, I come from a dirt jump and free ride background, and since I'm doing tricks all the time, I like my seat to be as out of the way as possible. And when it's not up like this, I like it as slammed close to the frame as it can get. That's why if you look at here, I only have maybe two inches of space between the seat post clamp and where the dropper stanchion starts. It gives me as little rim as possible between the seat and the frame, and I have lots of room to work with above the seat for moving my body around. The seat will never get in my way. It's nice and slammed down. Having a slam seat like this is also very beneficial if you're riding really steep, aggressive terrain because if it's down as low as possible when you're not going up, then when you're riding down like a big rock face and leaning back and getting your weight back, it's gonna be completely out of your way and you just don't even notice there's a seat there when you don't need it. And those are the major things you need to think about when you're dialing in your setup. Don't worry too much over whether you're doing the right or wrong thing. You'll quickly figure this out when you get there on the trails and something doesn't feel the way you want it to feel. I strongly encourage you ride with a shock pump, a multi-tool, and have all these little bits and pieces on you when you're out for a ride. So when you're on the trails and you decide you don't like the feel of your setup, you can dial it in on the fly and it's not something you have to stress about between each ride.